Hello everyone and welcome to our next talk in the treatments session and this is going to be a paper given by Hilary Jarvis uh, entitled Infestation Stations Novel Life Cycle Approach to Webbing Close Moth Eradication at Blickling Hall. Over to you Hilary. Hello everyone and thank you Nigel. Uh, Nigel himself as you can see is part of the team behind this project which we instigated in response to the growing realisation that webbing closed moth infestations and a small number of our historic houses are becoming embedded and potentially beyond the reach of our standard very preventive approach. We're also realising that it's the infestations more than the background populations which seem to be driving the numbers. So in 2019, we started to actively investigate new treatment options with the aim of eradicating an infestation at one of our properties. And we approached Historionics, who I hope you've all heard of by now, one of our sponsors, and spoke to David Lochlin, who it turns out sp spent about 20 years working on biological solutions to limit caterpillar and moth larvae damage to soft fruit. And he did that using a combination of pheromone disruption and mite parasitic micro wasps. Now he suggested that we needed to be more proactive in our approach and actively target all stages of the moth's life cycle 24-7 for one, maybe two years, embedding the two biological treatments into our existing regime. Now, this represents quite a robust stance for us, and I won't pretend that we weren't anxious and not a little bit cautious about this. We've never yet advocated such an interventive regime, but we were quite clear that there was a need. And I remember joking with David at the time that if what he proposed was OK for tomatoes, it was probably going to be OK for tapestries, too which is good news. It brings me to Blickling Hall, which has a number of very fine tapestries and was the obvious choice for us to test this new regime, having had a notable tineola infestation since about 2015. Adults caught on traps at the hall accounted for 15% of all tineola bacilliella caught across the trust in 2020 and 5% of all pests caught, in fact. So you can see it here, it's very grand. It has about 40 to 50 showrooms spread across three floors. There are typically four to five staff and a very loyal group of conservation volunteers. Crucially, it also has two staff apartments. It's in our top most 15 most visited properties for the Trust. And as you will see, it's got some sumptuous interiors. It's very richly furnished with a particularly fine textiles collection. So a few shots just to give you a sense, including this. It's the, one of the most famous rooms. It's called the Peter the Great Room after this tapestry, which is indeed Peter. And the tapestry was given to, by Catherine the Great to John Hobart, who was owner of Blickling at the time and was ambassador to Russia. This was in 1762. It was so important to him that he had his whole room back here at Blickling Hall remodelled in a project that took five years. And there's a fantastic plaster ceiling with a bespoke carpet that matches the design. There's silk wall hanging. There's the tapestry itself, which is about five metres by four metres. It's very impressive when you look at it. It is also very significant on many counts. And in fact, a Russian TV news crew came to film it when they heard about the project. Um, and on the other side of the wall, in fact, just there, you can see this room, which is the state bedroom. And that's Hobart's state bed with his ambassadorial bed can canopy, which, would you believe, he used to take with him on all his international travel. This was to signify that he was the physical representation of the king, if you like. Um, there's not much damage at Blickling, uh, not recent damage. But what, you, what we have got is mostly in that carpet that you can see, by the way. And that's the picture that I had on my opening slide. One last space to show you, which is this one. It's huge. It's the long gallery. That's quite common in buildings of this age where they were designed to have some recreation space indoors to protect from our lovely climate. It was converted into a library in the 19th century. It's about 60 metres long, but it's probably most famous, as you can see, not that much textile, but visitors and staff will tell you the air can be thick with moths in this space at certain times of year. And the moths tend to flit in and out of the bookshelves. So, Based on David's advice, we designed a trial around investigating the combination of the two additional biological treatments supported by increased monitoring, which went from monthly in addition to our quarterly regime, with increased housekeeping and some chemical fogging and deterrence. Both biological solutions have been used in a range of heritage settings, but with no sense of resounding success, certainly not swiftly. David's experience is that we could increase overall effectiveness by using them together, hence our novel combination. They're certainly commonly used together in this way in horticulture and food storage. So the first is the CL tab, which many of you will know, a waxy tab that contains female moth pheromone 
which, via an electrostatic formulation, covers the male as it approaches. He's then confused, loses the ability to locate females, so we're reducing mating encounters, but he also becomes a pheromone distributor himself, so this should, in theory, be quite effective. And you can see traces of the powder, I hope, here on that top right picture. It tends to drop into this little recessed area beneath the tab as a moth flutters nearby. We were a bit worried about this and the potential for powder to drop onto historic surfaces. So as an extra precaution, David designed the cardboard mount that you can see to address this. You need to change the tabs, sorry, uh, every week, eight weeks. And for us, that was challenging because for various reasons to do with supply, it could only be every 12 weeks. And we were a bit worried about this because, as you can imagine, one of our concerns was about the potential potency of this pheromone cloud in such large spaces. But you can also see that these things are small, they're discrete, they're non-disruptive, they're very easy to use. And house staff said that they were very easy to incorporate into our regime. So the second part of this novel combination is the parasitoid wasp, also not you. And in fact, it has been used at Blickling before, briefly when Bob Child did a small trial there in 2018. Like the tabs, published literature imply a varied reputation, certainly in the heritage world, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing Stefan's review after my talk. But our thinking was that in combination with the auto confusion from the tabs, we would get some quite compelling results. Also, like the tabs, one of our concerns was efficacy in such big spaces. These things really are tiny, less than half a millimetre long, and they're supplied in egg form within parasitised moth eggs, in fact, about 240,000 of them, of them in each of the little card dispensers. And you keep these card dispensers refrigerated until you want to deploy. And as they warm up, the wasps will hatch, mate, and the female will then need to locate the moth eggs, which she does by smell. And if you haven't, I'd urge you to check out Patrick's talk from um, Insects Limited, where he had some fantastic footage of female Tineola overpositing her eggs on wool. So David Pinniger, among others, had warned us that these things are not great flyers. We did our best to place the cards where we think the moths are laying. And you can see from the photos, this one here is one of those chairs in the Peter the Great room. There's a little card under there, and we're trying to get it close to skirting boards, floorboards and carpets. Um, Another thing we were worried about was the dead wasps, which we were told would not be a problem. But as you can see here, we did in certain places find quite a lot of them in large numbers, which these things obviously have to be cleared up. Now, this requires more research because we don't know why this happened. It could be that it's redundant males that die fairly swiftly on exiting the card, or it could also be on our book stacks. We know historically there was a lot of chemical treatment in the past, and these things are known to be quite sensitive, so they could be reacting to that. Now, Everyone's been calling for footage of the wasps flying, and I'm very happy to oblige. Although, as you can see, they're not really flying. And I hasten to add, this is not normal behaviour. What you can see here is a box of cards that have been left unrefrigerated for a couple of days for various reasons. That's the practicalities of trial life. And this is what was found when the box was opened up. So they're obviously ready to go, but they're not flying. So I'll try again with another, even more exciting bit of footage. You remember that Russian TV news crew? Well, they were determined to get some shots of them flying. Um, so David sent them some cards. And as you can see, there's some really quite compelling footage. So th what you're seeing here now, a little wasp that have only just hatched. They take a bit of time sometimes to get going. You can see this one. Look, his antennae are moving, but there's not much else going on at the moment. I hope you're also noticing there's quite a difference in the wing formation. So some of them are quite malformed. There are some examples of some that clearly weren't very viable. Um, but once they get going, as you'll see, they start to move and they do move very fast, although this is very definitely scuttling and crawling, not flying. There's an example of one that's not viable, but look at the size of the wings there. So that's the treatment plan, but the most challenging thing really in practice was which treatments to deploy where and how, because as you can imagine, we've got a, a, lot, of, a lot of space, a lot of rooms, a lot of floors, and not a huge amount of resource. We are also by this stage dealing with um, COVID, because the plan had originally been to deploy in 2020. The UK, for those of you that aren't here, went into quite a severe lockdown in March, so we put the programme on hold. But as 2020 progressed and 2021 loomed, we decided that we just had no option but to proceed anyway, um, even though by that stage the lockdown was severe and we had just two staff at Blickling left to look after the whole estate. So that's not just the building you saw, but the grounds and other buildings too. When we looked into the data, though, we could see that actually 81% of the adult moths caught in 2020 were in just 11 of the 67 rooms. So we realised it was actually, thank you, quite potentially more manageable than we thought. And we were happy to think that we might not have to give up on our target of trying to eliminate the moths totally. 
So this is what we did. We had decided that our aim was very clearly to establish two things. The efficacy of the pheromone tabs used as a sole treatment and comparing the efficacy when used um, in combination with the parasitoid wasps. As a control almost, we decided to leave three areas solely for chemical treatments. These were the two staff apartments and you can see those on the first floor, there's one here, flat B, and flat C on the attic floor. There's also a textile store on the attic floor. Now moth numbers were high in all of these spaces, particularly the textile store, which is a bit of a concern, but the textiles are all wrapped in, t in tissue and boxes on racking and there was no sign of any damage or activity on them. It's just in the room itself and to give you an idea, this is a turret, so there are lots of roof spaces and voids are here and all across this attic area so that's where we suspect the moths are but we were able to use the size of, of, of blickling to really stress test this by doing this so as you can see here the ground floor we decided just to use pheromone tabs and only pheromone tabs on the first floor we used the, the micro wasps and pheromone tabs with some fogging and, and chemical deterrents wardrobe deterrents and things in the flat here on the attic floor we did nothing except fogging on the in these two spaces as i've already mentioned so here we go with some early data but i'm going to urge you to be very cautious please don't be misled briefly to explain um when we initiated this i didn't think that i would have any data to compare with obviously this the data we've got here is using um the the uh, adults caught on our monthly traps in the march to august period and you can see the dark green bars that's 2020 that's the year before the light green bars is 2021 the period of treatment now i hadn't anticipated being able to have any of this dark green data because the standard protocol for monitoring at the trust is quarterly but as it happened the property bless them had started monitoring on a monthly basis in some spaces so I found that I have 20 rooms where I can compare that's not as extensive as I'd like and I wouldn't normally be drawing conclusions but we wanted to show you some data but instantly straight away I can tell you that there is some concern here because these big green bars in the 2020 period of March April May are way too high in the UK climate we wouldn't normally expect such a big difference between the catch of the UK spring and the summer it can summers be higher but not that much and we know this is likely to be the weather and for those of you that were in the UK in 2020 back in March you might remember it was gloriously warm and hot and sunny with lockdown we were very blessed but it was extraordinarily warm compared by contrast to 2021 March which was extremely chilly this is supported by our environmental monitoring data which shows an average of one to two degrees difference in temperature between these two periods before the treatment and during the treatment and although that doesn't sound a lot on a monthly basis one to two degrees difference would certainly be enough to drive moth life cycles so it's likely that weather is skewing the numbers here the other thing to say is that these um and by we get to the uh, period of treatment in an ideal world there would be pheromones literally swimming everywhere on those ground and first floors and it's quite possible that that's what was happening here so that there were moths or there might have been moths but there was so much pheromone they weren't being particularly drawn to the traps so some caution please but still worth examining this is that same data but shown by room um, and you can see there's yeah, obviously the huge difference. But if I overlay now the uh, treatment plan, just to remind you, we've got the pheromones only on that ground floor. We've got pheromones with wasps and chemical deterrents and fogging on the first floor and just the chemical fogging in the attic. And to give you some averages, here we are. So some caution, but it would suggest um, in this very early data that there is greater efficacy when we combine the tabs with the wasps certainly than just using pheromones only and actually i'm quite disappointed by what was happening just with chemicals so that will obviously need some review so next steps funnily enough we need to define success and that wouldn't be the first time i've embarked on a project without really thinking about that but if the aim is totally to eradicate how do we know when we have eradicated because we've certainly had two properties where we thought we'd gone on top of it recently and two years later the um, infestation came back rather like a certain virus i could have mentioned it's difficult to know when we're in the clear we also need to decide at what point we can be confident that either of these treatments could be incorporated into our new regime but that's very much the idea that we could perhaps move from quite a passive approach to one that's a bit more scalable. Um, so I've clearly got more work to do and I go and get on with it but in the meantime I'd like to thank you all for your intention and interest in this project. I'd like to thank my co-authors, the staff and volunteers and visitors at Blickling and also David Lachlan. Thank you and take care. Thank you Hilary and I hope you'll be joining us in the Q&A shortly so we'll see you soon. Thank you.